Once again, back to paying attention, and here is Tom Duggan. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Don't clap or anything, studio audience, when we come back from a break. That's okay. Don't worry about it. It's all good. It's all good. That was actually pretty good. It sounded like there was a lot more people here than there really are. Hi, I'm Tom Duggan. Thanks for uh, coming back to the Paying Attention podcast. Uh, I want to thank Fred and Meredith for coming in from Lyric Properties, Lyric Consulting. They're doing our news every week. Um, we're going to try and move some of these segments around. We had a, a different plan for today, but uh, our guest has to be somewhere, so we, we, we bumped her into the second segment. Uh, so sitting with me today is uh, my favorite state rep in, in the entire state. And anybody who knows me knows I don't just say that because people are here. You actually are my favorite state rep. Uh, and every time Jim Lyons calls me, I always answer the phone, how's my second favorite state rep? And he just cracks up laughing because he knows you're my, you're my favorite. Well, I'm your state rep, so that makes me very that, happy. That's true. She represents North Andover. She represents Methuen and parts of Haverhill and Lawrence, too, right? So Diane is here because we had the four police chiefs on a couple of weeks ago. We had the police chief from – we had Joe Solomon from Methuen, Jim Ryder from Boxford, Chuck Gray from North Andover, and who am I forgetting? Uh, Alan Denial from Haverhill. Um, almost all of which you cover, and they had a lot of uh, really great ideas about things that they could, that they wanted done to help them fight the opioid crisis. And I said, well, you know, they came up with a couple of great ideas. Why don't we get a state rep on who's really up on this opioid crisis, have her talk about it, and then see what she thinks about their ideas? So you said before we get on the air that you read the story of the interview with the police chiefs. I didn't get to read that oh, one. I read oh, the one the with the mayor. Uh, yeah, with the mayor. I, 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 I but I did just see that you did interview all four of them, so and that's great. Tell people who you are first, and, and, and just get people familiar with who you are in case they've, they've never uh, they've never heard of you, and then talk about you've got a new opioid bill that you just passed, and that's something I think we want to talk about too, right? So, well, I'm Diana DiZoglio. I'm one of the state reps in the area. Like Tom was saying, I represent portions of Methuen, Lawrence, Haverhill, and North Andover, and I'm really grateful to be here today to actually talk to some of your audience. We're, we're grateful that, to have you. Well, I know a, a lot of uh, you know my constituents and people that vote in my area listen to your show, and it's a great opportunity to be able to address them directly. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, you yeah. notice how far away she's sitting from me, though, because she doesn't have the security <laughs> detail. It's the cigarette smoke. Oh, it? the cigarette smoke. <laughs> I, see, I promised I wouldn't smoke while you were here. Thank you. I appreciate it. I wouldn't do that for anybody, actually. <laughs> actually, I wouldn't do that for anybody. You're the only person I'll thank say that I'll do it for. So no other guest can say that. I appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a couple of years ago, we actually did pass a comprehensive bill uh, regarding overall substance abuse issues and addiction-related issues. And uh, that bill included things such as the seven-day uh, limit on prescription opioids uh, that we worked hand-in-hand -hand with Governor Baker on and with the state senate on. It can, you included, just, can you sort of limit, what, what does yeah. that mean, seven-day uh, waiting period on opioids. What is that? How does that work? So what it is is what's been happening in recent years since the 90s when uh, drugs like OxyContin became legal and were really advertised and promoted. Uh, what was happening is that we were seeing a lot of overprescribing going on. Um, so doctors. Yeah, certainly not every doctor, mm -hmm. uh, but there were. Uh, many cases in which overprescribing was happening. Now, I don't think that that was, you know, the doctor's intent. I think that uh, there was just a lack of education and that, you know, what the legislature looked at during the last couple of years is that overprescribing is being a significant reason why people ended up being addicted to opioids and then, you know, transitioning into drugs like heroin, like fentanyl, like what we're seeing right now. So the way that the legislature and the administration came together to try to combat that, um, you know, rising use of opioids overall was to target prescription opioids and to try to uh, make it so that it was a little bit, uh, you know, more stringent regarding the regulations, so the doctors were more educated, and that so and that we were so that we were able to actually track as well, or not us, but the doctors were able to track who was doctor shopping and find out who was going from doctor to doctor to try to find a way to get their prescription opioids. So what's the seven-day waiting? The seven-day waiting is that a doctor now cannot, for the, when it's the first time a person's being given a prescription, if you go in and you get you know, dental surgery or you, you break your leg or something, they can give you up to seven days of a prescription opioid. I see. So like when I got my wisdom tooth out, I got, I got addicted to, to Vicodin. Mm -hmm. So I had my wisdom teeth out. They gave me Vicodin. Um, within a week I was gobbling four or five Vicodins a day because mm -hmm. the pain was just, it was just horrible. Um, and, but I had like a 90 day 
supply. Like my doctor wrote me like a 90 day supply. So I had like three bottles. And they were gone in like a week and a half. And that's what the issue was. It was that people were getting over what they needed. There was leftover, uh, you know, opioid mm-hmm. prescriptions, whatever it was. And a lot of people were actually saying to us on the committee, cause I serve in the committee for mental health and substance misuse. So a lot of people were saying to us, well, I got this prescription, and then I thought that I was supposed to finish the prescription. Right. My doctor told me to take this. Mm-hmm. Um, or I got this prescription, and it was way too much. I kept it around, but then I used it on an as-need basis. Or I got overprescribed, and my son or my daughter mm-hmm. or my spouse started using the So this seven-day waiting period basically says, like, if I go to a brand-new doctor and say, hey, look, I need opioids, they got to wait at least, like, seven days before they can give me. So it's not that. It's actually that if they diagnose you with something that warrants in their medical opinion. They can only give you seven days' worth of supply. Exactly. Gotcha. Exactly. Okay. Excellent. So you, you have an, uh, another bill that you pushed um, on, and I'm, I'm looking because Kiana sent me the notes here. Uh, no Good job, Kiana. Sorry. Uh, second, diverts women at Framingham into other treatment facilities geared toward women for further treatment. So you had a bill um, that restrained prescription OxyContin for under 17, but you also had a bill um, as far as women who were addicted that were in prison. So we actually included both of those provisions, versions of both of those provisions in that comprehensive bill that we passed a couple of years ago. Um, the governor actually, you know, several of us actually filed that provision and the governor ended up including that in his comprehensive opioid bill that did divert women in Framingham to other facilities where they were able to actually receive treatment instead of just being put behind bars, not receiving medical attention, not receiving any sort of, uh, you know, counseling or, you know, the services that they would need to actually transition off of being addicted into recovery. So, um, you know, I commend the governor for his leadership on that and on working together with us on the committee in moving that forward and a version of that did pass in that comprehensive bill. Uh, as far as the limitations on uh, OxyContin for children under 17, I don't know how many people remember this, but a couple of years ago during, I think it was August, um, I forget what year it was actually, but I just remember sitting there, it was a hot August day, and I remember reading in the paper that the FDA had approved use of OxyContin for children under 17 for the first time in history. Got to love that Obama administration. Now, this was actually something where we were already in the middle of the opioid epidemic and scrambling as a state, you know, as the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and all the other states were scrambling as well. On the federal level, they're scrambling as well to find solutions to this. In the middle of, well, we're all, as lawmakers, scrambling to work together with voters and work together with advocates. Yeah, the federal government district. pulled the rug out right from under you. The FDA approved OxyContin for children under 17. So... I was in the middle of helping out with this, uh, the drafting of this comprehensive opioid legislation. And while we were drafting this opioid legislation, the FDA approved OxyContin for children under 17. Those so, bastards. So I, I filed a bill and, you know, some people said it goes a little bit too far and that's okay. I like to push the envelope a little bit. That's what you we know. like about you. And, uh, you know, it went, went before the committee. We had, you know, a, a couple of people that had concerns about that, but we worked together Uh, We heard from residents, we heard from parents, we heard from doctors, we heard from uh, psychiatrists and social workers and and people who work in school districts. And, you know, at the end of the day, we ended up, you know, Mass Medical Society, everybody. And at the end of the day, we ended up coming up with something that was a compromise, which, as you know, sometimes you need to push for the strongest possible Mm -hmm. thing in order to end up with that compromise. What everybody hates about Donald Trump, but they all do the same thing, right? You always over ask, you always over promote, and then you compromise back, right? So... That she's not touching the Trump thing. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> well, I'm going to talk about state issues right now. Um, so, yeah, so what we ended up doing is we actually ended up taking that, uh, you know, that version of the bill and adding in some provisions that, you know, made a lot of the doctors more comfortable, made a lot of the parents more comfortable as well, um, who did have children who, may, you know, maybe were on prescription opioids for something pertaining to things like cancer, for example, uh, that were in palliative care, that had end of life care or a terminal illness of some sort, um, or it was an emergency medical situation that, you know, doctors had deemed it was necessary for them to continue to receive that, that treatment and that medication. We worked together and we set up a couple of different provisions that did provide, um, you know, opportunities for those specific circumstances to be able to receive those medications under the direct supervision of a doctor. However, not for any other reason. So, um, if they do receive any of these substances now, uh, they are on a seven day supply, limited supply 
And then do they have to be reevaluated? The time. They have to be reevaluated every seven okay, days so, unless they have one. So that's of those good cases. because otherwise they would just prescribe it for seven days and just renew it after seven days. They've got to be reevaluated. Now that's right? still the case with adults, okay. but you're an adult coming back now. With the children, the goal is is to prevent you know that child from being addicted un unknowingly. Right. Uh, you know because they happen to be sick and they get on the prescription opioid. Next thing you know. They're addicted. So we got a big question for you because we had all four chiefs here. All of them but one agreed. Um, I think Chuck Gray was the only one that kind of didn't agree. Um, but the rest of them all said that they believe the one – I said – I threw out the last question. I said, what's the one thing if you could wave a magic wand, the legislature could do something to help you guys, what would it be? And three of the four of them said – Listen, when we go out and we Narcan someone, they go to the hospital. They can check themselves out. And three hours later, we're Narcaning them again. Um, if the legislature could pass some kind of a law that made it a mandatory, like 15 to 30 days, to go get uh, to get clean, to get whatever rehab, whatever it is, it gives the families a break because they've been dealing with this crap all you know day, on a daily basis. The families are burnt out. Families have been stolen from. All the problems that they're having, and it gives the person's body a chance to detox. And then if they come out and they go and they do it again, well, that's one thing. But it gives the cops a break, the families a break, and the person's body a break. Is that something that you would introduce for our chiefs, for our, for our cops? I would absolutely. And I actually did introduce something similar uh, to that with Chief Solomon, who was a tremendous resource for me during. He's the, awesome. He was. He was. He was really great during uh, during the time that we were writing that that. Uh, substance abuse legislation a couple of years ago and I was on the phone with him all the time asking him questions and trying to understand you know what the struggles are of our public safety officials and he was really good at breaking things down for me to um, to really get insight in what they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and I am in full agreement with all of the chiefs that said that I think that too many times what happens is you do have somebody go in they have the issue with overdosing they, you know, wake them up, get them out of the overdose, and as soon as they're okay enough to, you know, sort of stand on their own two feet. Yeah, they go out and they find more heroin. They're out there and right. they're looking for that high again. Right. They are looking for that high again. Um, you know, I have all of my public safety officials telling me that they'll Narcan somebody and the person will wake up and be infuriated yeah. with them because they lost the high. Right. Now, there they are saving their lives, right. but the person is so addicted and so not in their right mind that the first thing they think is, you ruined my high, right. and now I feel sick because you, you ruined my high. I'm dealing with these people on a daily basis because you see I'm out there in Lawrence. I'm chasing police calls, and I talk to people on the streets. I want to talk to everybody, whether you're a criminal, you're a cop, whoever. Um, and I talk to a lot of these people who are addicted, especially the ones that are uh, going into daybreak to get, to get help. And it's amazing that the the addiction to heroin and especially with the fentanyl it takes over their entire thought process their whole brain changes when they start getting addicted they can't think about they're not interested in eating mm -hmm. they're not interested in finding food they're not interested in getting out of the cold we've got a homeless veteran on our merrimack street i'm sure you see him every day steven zowell uh he's a, he's actually a veteran because i pulled up one day and said get rid of that sign if you're not a veteran and he showed me his dd 214s i felt this small um, but we offered to get him into Veterans Northeast Outreach. I called Randy Carter, and he said, we've got a unit. You can get him in your car. We'll put him in a unit right now. He'll never sleep on the street again. Mm -hmm. And it was three degrees outside. And I pulled up, and I asked him, and he was like, no, the only thing I want right now is to get enough money to get my next fix. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, so it doesn't matter that it's three below zero. It doesn't matter that they sleep in the streets. All of those things become secondary to them because that addiction is so strong. The physical need for the fentanyl and the heroin is so strong that it supersedes all of the other physical needs that, that most brains know that you need, you know, sleep and food and, and water. And so they, they, they really literally just don't care. All they care about is their next high. And mm -hmm. so you're right. The cops go out and they Narcan these people and they get pissed off because it costs them their high. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, if, and if they don't go to the hospital, some of them don't, the minute the cops walk away, they're looking for their next high. And I, I talk to the Lawrence cops all the time. They tell me that they've had people that they've not came three and four times in a day. Mm -hmm. And Joe Solomon told us last week that two weeks ago that there are people that now that they're using four and five canisters of Narcan on them because they've been Narcan so many times, their body's built up an immunity to the Narcan. Mm -hmm. Not the fentanyl, not the heroin, but the Narcan. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm glad I'm glad that, you're, uh, that you'd are you be interested in doing that, uh, introducing that bill. I'd like to help you work on that if you'd be interested in having Oh, absolutely. Help. That'd be great. Yeah. So what else are you working on? we got about four or five minutes with you, and I know you've got to be in North End over in a half hour. Um, what, what, what are some of the things that you're working on now, especially given, you know, you know what we're talking about, the drug crisis, police officers, all that kind of stuff? Well, I mean, I'm just going to continue on the same topic and just talk about what I'm working on right now, like you asked. But I think that um, I think a lot of things that you were talking about really touch on uh, one particular subject, which is that we need to be able to fund um, 
the things that we want to see happening. And I know we're going to get into the funding issue, but you know, you said it yourself. Okay, so if we need the money, just tell us where it's being spent and tell us how it's being spent. Right, yeah, I we just want to know how the help government spends the money. And I think that that's more than a fair enough request. So right, I think yeah. that I think that um, when we talk about you know uh, you know all of these different services that are provided, you just mentioned Randy, Car- Randy Carter and the Northeast Veterans Outreach. I actually was just on the phone with Randy Carter in the parking lot here before I was coming on your show. I said, oh, he said, how's your buddy Tom Duggan? I said, I'm going to see him right now. I'm going on his show. He should be here. Why isn't he, Randy here? He said to say hello to you, but. But, um, you know, but, but, but what, what, what organizations like the Northeast Veterans Outreach Center are doing is they're providing opportunities for, you know, people who do have issues but who want to seek help and who just need that, that helping hand, who need a little bit of outreach, who need, you know, some care, um, who need to find a warm place, a warm bed, you know, have a, a hot meal mm-hmm. and need to have a shoulder, honestly, to cry on while they're while and, they're detoxing. And if you're a veteran and you can get to Veterans Northeast Outreach, they'll send you to rehab. And because you're a veteran, you're not going to pay anything. If you need a place to stay, they've got units there. They've actually got apartments. They've got buildings that they've that they've rented, leased, or purchased on that street. So, I mean, when I'm out and I'm chasing calls and I see someone, if I know they're a veteran, I'll try to get them into my car. I'll try to get them up to Veterans Northeast Outreach. Uh, most of them, they just did. All they really care about is their high. They're just so obsessed with the high. It's 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 such a it has so taken over, especially with the fentanyl, so taken over their brain that they're not thinking right anymore. Listen, and we both have loved ones as well we do. who are addicted right. to opioids. Mm-hmm. And it's devastating to watch them spiral down and not be able to reach them. Is that why you're so involved and so vested in Yes. Uh, I mean you could you're a state rep. You could you could be focused on a myriad of a hundred other issues if you wanted, you know, construction projects and infrastructure and all that. But you've tended to focus on the opioid crisis, and is it because of the person, the personal? So it is because of the personal connection with people who are who are loved ones who I've seen become addicted due to prescription opioids in particular, um, but also because of people in my community that I've grown up with that I've known since childhood, just watching them spiral. Uh, watch, you know, talking to community advocates, people like Phil Leahy. Um, we'll you know, get him on at some point. Yeah, who we started Merrimack Valley Prevention and Substance Abuse project together that whole group i mean that group has done tremendous work in the merrimack valley they've done more than the government has done in the last 30 years phil Leahy's group in the last three years has done more than government there's no question about it well it it makes me happy to see them succeed so much um considering that we had very humble beginnings back in 2013 i mean it was me and phil Leahy sitting in a room trying to talk to a group of people he used to call me saying me and diana are meeting like do you want to come down and help and i'm like no (laughs) <laughs> what, what, what? I don't want to get involved. That's a whole mess. So I'm not. But people with that. like them as well. They are providing vital services to families in our area, in North Andover, in Methuen, in Lawrence, in Haverhill, in Andover, that other organizations or the government can't really provide. You know, you can't legislate somebody. You know, giving you a hug and telling you it's going to be okay, and talking you through a if breakdown. If you passed a when bill for mandatory hugs, I would support that. <laughs> We'll talk about that one, but I think that I think that when we talk about these organizations, it again bringing it back to the funding issue, it's not about necessarily spending more. It's about making sure that we're spending the tax revenues that are coming in on the right things. Now you were just talking about marijuana, right? So mm-hmm. you're talking about it from the local issue, from the local perspective, all the different projects that may or may not be going on based on the local votes. At the state level, we had the uh, marijuana bill come before the legislature after it was after it was approved. I hope you voted the right way on that. And uh, I, act- I actually voted against it. Good for you. That was the right way. Well, I did. I, I didn't think that it was. Um, I just didn't think that it was a bill that actually honored the will of the voters first and foremost. I think that a lot of good things were included in the bill, and I do commend the people that worked on it. Um, I had some amendments that were included in the legislation, but at the end of the day there wasn't enough to offset the things that I think that we needed to change. And I wanted to see some more provisions added in there, um, especially considering the fact that we are still in the middle of a substance abuse epidemic overall. So do you see, do you see this? Cause you're seeing it from a different perspective than we do on this end, right. this opioid crisis. Are we, are we near the end? Are we still n- near the beginning? Do you think we're in the middle? Like, where do you think this crisis is? Are we? No, we still have a years? long way to go. So we're still just at the beginning. A long of all way this. to go. A long way to go. And unless we have a cons- continued concerted effort, now the governor is coming before us on the mental health and substance misuse committee. Um, I believe it's this week or next week. He's coming before us, and he will be presenting his second. 
uh, you know, uh, second version of an opioid bill that he's going to be presenting to us to, to be voted on, hopefully, by the end of the session. Uh, I'm looking forward to that because that actually provides a vehicle for reps like myself who, you know, I've been trying to get bills through committee, but they keep getting hung up in committee for months and months and months. Or years and years see, and years. But see, when that happens, you've got to let me, people like me know, not just me. But oh, I do. Like me and you know. call in and you advocate. Right, yeah. You because if I, know, you know. if I know there's a state rep on a committee holding up one of your bells, they'll get a phone call from me. I promise oh, you. I promise you, before that committee meeting is over, they're not going to be giving you any crap. I do appreciate it. And I and I need the support from my constituents calling, mm -hmm. calling in and supporting the bills that we're trying to pass together. But – the governor filing a bill like this provide it does provide a vehicle, um, you know, because we can actually take some of the bills that we've been working on and we can have conversations with the administration and with our committee chairs and with House leadership about, you know, possibly adding in as an addition to what the governor is proposing some of our ideas and that, um, you know, it tends to be a good conversation when we have those conversations because we're already in the mindset of we're working on this comprehensive bill. Um, How do we get more? I know, I know you have to go, so I don't want to. Uh, I have to cut you off. How do we get more beds for addicts? How do we get more? How do we get more beds and more rehab? Because we have walk. It's like the Walking Dead. You drive through Lawrence on any given day. It literally is like the Walking Dead. You've got a hundred people who are homeless addicts who are walking through the streets, begging people for money, begging, bumming cigarettes off people. It creates an unsafe environment. One guy got stabbed the other night and he almost died. Uh, what, what, what can the legislature, what will the legislature do to get more beds and more treatment facilities? So I know we were talking about the marijuana bill and we kind of stopped and shifted because that's what right, we do. We right. ride a trail. It's okay. Um, but we're friends. We do this at sales all the time. This is how it is. But, um, but one of the ways that we can get more beds and get more treatment and get more of the resources that we need to go to where they are actually needed right. um, is by holding legislature's head to the flame when it comes to the issue of directing that funding to those treatment facilities, directing the funding to places like the Psychological Center, like MVP ASAP, like Northeast Veterans Outreach. And the way that we make sure that those programs are funded, the programs that are actually working, that we can see that they're working. We don't have to look at numbers to see that they're working. We actually know by being in the community that right. they're doing great work. Right. Um, it's tangible for us. The way that we see that funding come back so that they can provide those additional resources is by keeping our word. Now, during the recent marijuana debate, you know, the House originally said that we were going to de we were going to dedicate a minimum of ten million dollars of the anticipated two hundred million dollars. You you in blew revenue. you blew your stack on the floor of the House, and it was the greatest speech I'd seen in twenty years in the House. Thank you. That was awesome. <laughs> it depends on where you were sitting. <laughs> um, well, when a Democrat is calling out the leadership of the Democrat Party for anything, that's always a good thing because dissension within a party always always results in good stuff. Well, it's the right thing to do, and you know what? I think that a lot of members of the party that I belong to, the Democratic Party, I think that they do agree. You know, on this particular. Then why didn't day, they step up to the plate? They they agree when you're having a coffee with them, and then when they go to vote, they vote the other way. That's a conversation you have to have with each individual legislator. I can't presume to know what they're thinking when they go to vote. I can tell you that the provision that I sponsored on the marijuana um, legislation got adopted in the marijuana legislation, and then it got withdrawn. Yeah, they killed it. It got killed right. during the conference committee during because the because they weren't making any money on it. And what ended not up not enough lobbyists paid for them to vote that way. So what ended up happening is when we came back, I filed another provision on you know another bill that was another vehicle for me to pass this provision to go back to our original idea of dedicating some of the revenue to the area of substance abuse. And this is the speaker of the house came out and, you know, I, I work with the speaker and with my leadership team on, on different things that are important to my district. And I'm grateful for the work that they did in this bill. But at the end of the day, the speaker did say that we were going to have a minimum of $10 million dedicated to a substance abuse fund yeah, or to a lied. substance addiction fund. And you lied. And what ended Where's up Linda happening, Campbell on this? She's friends with the speaker. She's part of leadership. Where is she on all this? How did I, she vote on your bill? So I, I'm, I'm not sure offhand. But well, that means no. She doesn't want to say it, but if she does not, if you're not sure when Linda, Linda voted, she must have voted. I, I, don't, I don't keep track of everybody else's voting She records. hates I'm, controversy. Can you tell? <laughs> I'm here to talk about the things that I'm working on for my district. But, but what ended up happening is you know, we tried to get that funding restored and all of a sudden it was, okay, we're not going to do this anymore. And, you know, I told my colleagues in the house that I'm very good friends with a lot of them. 
listen, this is something that I'm not backing down on. We said we're going to do this. And I have people in my district that are really struggling. They can't find a bed. They can't find a treatment facility that want to get treatment. Also, we have prevention and education initiatives that are supposed to be going on right now that we can't fund. We have the Students Against Destructive Decisions at Methuen High School that Dean Broder is running and that helps to, uh, you know, towards the efforts of prevention and education. We have all of these great things that are working, but if the legislature doesn't want to assist in ac actually making sure that there's a consistent and dedicated stream of revenue, how can we expect that we're going to continue to see the benefits from those organizations in the way that we want to see them? So there's a lot more work to be done. We've made you know tremendous strides in the you know uh, in the areas of prescription limitation, uh, you know uh, the doctor uh, the doctor shopping issue with prescription monitoring, right. limiting, pres days. limiting prescriptions on children, the advertising of opioids. Uh, we've done a lot of great things, but again, there's still more work to be done and it's going to take all of us continuing to have these conversations uh, in the community to be able to to see a positive result. Will you come back? I will absolutely come back. Thank you. We'd like to have you come back to talk about a bunch of other issues, but this opioid thing is big and since we had the chiefs here and they had a, they had a wish list, I thought I'd throw it at you and see if we can't get it done. You know, we're about getting things done here, not just about educating people. At least we try anyway. Well, thank you for having me on again. I appreciate it. Thank you, Diana Dizogli. And if anybody wants to contact me, please feel free. My phone number is 978-390-0408. And my email is diana.dizoglio at mahouse.gov. I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, we, will, we will put all that up on the screen when we do post-production. Uh, Diana Dizoglio, State Representative. First of all, uh, before we let you go, I just want to thank, thank you for one more thing. I don't think you get thanked enough. Thank you so much for beating Dave Teresi and throwing his ass out of the legislature when you ran against him and you won. Thank you so much for doing that, seriously. When you ran, I didn't think you could want you could win. I said, I'll help her, but I don't think she's got a shot, and you beat him. And thank God you did, because look at what he's pulling in North Andover now. I'm happy to be on your show, Tom, and I appreciate you inviting me in today. Puppies and rainbows. <laughs> thank All right, you Thank so you very much, much Diana. Uh, we'll be back after this one paying attention. Hey, studio audience! We're gonna get Sean the Barista up here next.